And good evening, everyone. Happy Friday. Welcome to another edition of Rebel Watch. I'm Carson Ware. With me, Newswatch sports reporter Jason Kern and Joseph Rogers here with us as well from Rebel Radio. Going to talk some Ole Miss sports, going to talk a little NBA, a little NFL. As we all know, the conference championships just wrapped up this past Sunday. We'll have the recaps, basketball season in full swing. We'll have some coverage of the men's and women's teams for you here. Going to be a lot of fun. So we'll start things out on the court. The women's basketball team having a lot of success as we approach about the midway mark in this season. Coach Yo has got an exciting squad out there on the court. And we are going to start things off talking about Angel Baker. A little bit of a surprise this year, guys. We thought Madison Scott coming in would be no doubt the leader of the team with Shakira Austin now gone. All those shots would go to her. Angel Baker has been the one to step up, averaging about 15 a game, leading scorer on the team. Joseph, just talk a little about her, about her impact this year. I mean, Angel Baker's impact cannot be understated for this Lady Reb squad. Uh, 15 points, uh, shooting 34% uh, from the three, leading the team as well in that category. Uh, Madison Scott hasn't been, you know, the one leader that we thought she would be, but she's still chipping in a nice 12 and 9 on 53% shooting. Absolutely. And we got to praise Coach Yo. 18 and 4, a very competitive product she's putting out on the court right now. Getting into some tougher games here in the SEC as that schedule really starts to ramp up as we get into the tail end of this season. And now we'll talk about the philosophy a little bit, guys. So a lot of focus on the defense from Coach Yo. Talked in a press conference last week about getting three stops in a row, and that's called a kill in her book, and they keep track of how many of those they get. Jason, just talk a little bit about the defense for the Rebels and the impact that's had, and it's really helped them win quite a few games here. I mean, this is where Madison Scott steps up. She's got 21 blocks on the year, and she is right there with the rest of the pack. Everyone's stepping in, chipping in, and, I mean, in the end of the day, the team just looks – put together on defense, and that's what's leading to points on offense. Absolutely. Ole Miss sitting at fourth in the SEC currently. South Carolina, LSU, Tennessee all got very strong squads this year. That's the main competition. This team will probably be around as, unless something goes terribly wrong, but I don't see that happening. This team's going to be around in March Madness, hopefully make a run. And it has been pretty much a pick right, right up where they left off from last year. Last year, obviously, team being ranked for a majority of the season, getting some really, really nice wins, and just generating a whole, whole lot of excitement around here in Oxford. And now we're going to move on to the men's side of things, a season that's still got some time to maybe turn around a little bit, but not been quite as successful. The men's squad in their most recent game lose to Kentucky. That was on Tuesday night, a really tough loss there. Pretty competitive in the first half, really, but as the game went on, some things started to go wrong. Shooting went a little bit cold, and Kentucky started to make some big baskets. Offensive rebounding ended up hurting the Rebels a little bit. Just Jason, just talk a little bit about that game. Jason was there covering the game. What exactly went wrong in that second half that changed the tide and, and really helped the Wildcats pull away? We were tied at 32 at the half, and in the first half, we were right there with them. Defense looked great, offense putting up shots. You got Amari Abram. Didn't look, it looked like he didn't miss the entire first half. Um, Kentucky looked out of sorts a little bit, both offensively and defensively. We held, we held Oscar Shebway in check for most of the game, with only 14 points and 11 boards. But throughout the game, we were in it the entire time. And although we don't look good on paper, this team is in every single game they have played so far. And they're just a couple shots away from winning a few games. They are in almost every single game. They just got to learn how to finish in the end. Yep, and going back to Amari Abram, Joseph, talk a little bit about that. A true freshman on the team contributing in a big way. His shooting's been great and shown a lot of signs of maturity that a lot of freshmen, you won't really see that from him. He doesn't really make those mistakes that you see a lot of these freshmen make. Just talk a little bit about that. That's true. It's been, it's been a uh, nice change of pace to uh, have a freshman come in and kind of uh, take, take over in some, some parts. Um, he's going to have to do some more heavy lifting with uh, Deshaun Ruffin stepping away for the time being. Uh, but I look for the freshman to keep up the great play and uh, only improve from here. Absolutely. And another guy in that backyard, obviously, Matthew Morrell, averaging about 15 a game. Been really, really good for Amari Abram. It's been a great role model for him to sort of learn from, show him the ropes. Morrell's got a great three-point shot and has been one of the Rebels' leading scoring options this year. Jason, talk a little bit about Morrell's impact and just what he's meant to the team in the last few years. Not only is he great offensively, but defensively is where he thrives. 
He is electric on the defense. Him and Miles Burns look fantastic on defense, and that's what really leads the pack. And not having him really just goes to show how important he is to this Rebels offense and defense. Absolutely, and Miles Burns, as you mentioned, one of the leaders on the defensive end, the leading rebounder on the team. So this team's got some pieces, Joseph. There's a few things here that we like, but as we saw, especially last Tuesday, it was evident. Pretty stagnant on offense, getting into their sets, but taking eight or nine seconds to get into those sets. Just talk a little bit about when you take a while to get your play going and it shortens up your shot clock, how can that really kind of throw a wrench in your offensive game plan? Uh, when, you, when you take so long, it doesn't let your guys get in a rhythm. I mean, you look at the numbers, we're averaging 67 points a game, which ranks 333rd in the country. And we're only averaging just under 13 assists in the game. You just do not win basketball games playing one-on-one -on -one anymore. Absolutely, yeah. So the team currently sits at second to last in the SEC, 9-13 and 13 overall record. But there are some games coming up in the near future, play like Vanderbilt, Georgia, South Carolina. These are some teams that are pretty low in the standings as well. Possibly a chance to get back in it a little bit and maybe recuperate and get some momentum going into next season. Guys, anything to say about that? Just going forward a little bit, talking about, you know, maybe we can find something a little bit and, and get some of these guys going and get a little momentum going into the next season. I mean, these next three games are going to be the most important three games of the season. This is what's going to define this team. You look at Vandy this Saturday. They go into Nashville. Vandy just, Vandy's coming off an 101-44 to loss, getting blown out in Tuscaloosa. That was not pretty. Who knows how they're going to respond after that. Then you have South Carolina at home. We beat them by 12 in South Carolina. So that's another very winnable game. And then Georgia, we go to Athens. I mean, the entire game against Georgia, we were winning most of the game, and then we just couldn't finish. And that's what led to Georgia, I think, winning by four or five. But... We, we can hang with these teams, and these next three are going to be super important for the team and for Kermit. Absolutely. Yeah, so definitely a chance to get things back on track a little bit. We're going to step away from the basketball court for a little bit. We'll be back later. We're going to talk some NFL. The conference championship games just wrapped up this past Sunday. The Chiefs win a very entertaining game in Arrowhead against Joe Burrow's Bengals. And the Eagles pretty much stomp all over the 49ers in Philadelphia. Two games, so now your Super Bowl matchup, Eagles, Chiefs. So we'll start with the Chiefs game here. The Chiefs really contain Joe Burrow and company pretty well, better than most teams have all season. And you get to Burrow five times, they sack him five times. And really one thing that I think I also would like to talk about here Joseph, talk a little bit about the running game for Cincinnati. The longest run of the day for the, for the Bengals was 14 yards, and it was by Burrow, really containing those running backs, P. Ryan and Mixon, that have given a lot of teams some pretty big problems. Talk a little bit about that for Kansas City. Mixon is a stud. I mean, when other teams can find a way and try to bottle him up, and, and they do, the Bengals do not have success. They have to get the run game going to incorporate receivers like T. Higgins and Jamar Chase, both of which were under 100 yards on the day. The run game sets up the pass, and, and the uh, Bengals didn't do it this weekend. Absolutely. And we just saw Marcos about a scaling catch a touchdown there. Talk a little bit about, J Jason, these Kansas City receivers. We hear Kelsey. We hear Pacheco. We don't hear as much about these Kansas City receivers. I think they get written off a little bit at times. How dangerous are they? Are they even impossible to stop when the receivers are clicking with Mahomes? Before the season, some had a lot of questions. No Tyreek Hill. What's, who's Mahomes going to throw to? They go pick up Scantling. They go pick up Juju Smith-Schuster, who's been very quiet. He's been injured. Who knows if he's going to play in the Super Bowl. But they have been sneaky good. And with a, with a quarterback like Mahomes, I mean, it really doesn't take the greatest receiver in the league. They would have catch passes from him. He throws it on a dime almost every pass. So although they don't have Tyree Kill, they have a couple of very good additions like Juju and Scantling who have been excellent for the team so far this season. Absolutely, and a little bit more injury talk. We saw the Jerry Sneed go down with an injury. That's pretty much been the Chiefs' top corner all season. Not sure if he's gonna play in the Super Bowl. He's got some time to get better. He didn't practice yesterday, so that's a developing story. That might mean that some of these rookies on that Kansas City defense like Christian Watson need to step up, and that could be a very interesting thing. 
Now, as we move on a little bit, we'll stay on the defensive side of the ball for Kansas City and some of these blitzes from Steve Spagnuolo, which were beautifully drawn up. Some say that earlier in the season when these two teams faced off, that Spagnuolo didn't show kind of everything he had, which I think there is some truth to that. There were some pressures coming that Cincinnati definitely had a tough time picking up. Joseph, talk a little bit about that, how important that is in a game when a defensive coordinator can dial it up like that, how disruptive that can be. I mean, Spagnuolo is one of the most aggressive DCs in the, in the league. Um, you look at his numbers, high blitz rate, Frank, Frank Clark and uh, Chris Jones both had great games. I mean, they combined for three and, uh, three and a half sacks and eight QB hits. The uh, retooled uh, Cincinnati Bengals line just could not stop them. Absolutely. And we will stay on the defensive side of the ball. How about Mike Hilton, an Ole Miss alum? We'll talk about Cincinnati for a little bit, even though they came out on the losing end. A great season for him. Some say he's over the hump. Didn't look like it at all this year, especially towards the end part, the most important part of the season. He was fantastic, blitzing out of the slot. Just, Jason, talk about the impact that can have. You don't see many guys, you know, Derwin James, I think, and Jamal Adams, really, besides Mike Hilton, are the only two that get a lot of credit for being great blitzers out of the slot and out of the secondary. Talk about the impact that can have for a defense. I mean, rarely do you see an Ole Miss defensive player in the league. You got A.J. Brown, D.K. Metcalf, all these top-name players. They're all on the offensive side, but when you see defensive players like Mike Hilton, it just gets all the Ole Miss fans happy. And then even when he's thriving on the Bengals' defense, it's even great for the, the Bengals' fan base and the organization to see a guy like him thriving. I wouldn't really say come out of nowhere, but just really step up when it's most important. Definitely. Hilton found... Almost the second win in his career after his stint with Pittsburgh. He was solid for them. Goes over to their division rival and is just as good, if not better. Let's talk about the NFC Championship for a little bit. 49ers get steamrolled by the Philadelphia Eagles. Eagles look to just be entirely too much. Brock Purdy, unfortunately, gets hurt. His miracle run of undefeated and undefeated streak comes to an end. Pretty dominant performance, really, from the Eagles. The game was over relatively quickly. One thing I wanted to highlight, Joseph, is the Eagles, not that they didn't use Jalen Hurts. He had a rushing touchdown. Hurts only completing 15 passes. Do you think that was the Eagles trying to change up their scheme or the fact that the game was going so well they didn't really need him? Yeah, I think it just went with the flow of the game. I mean, we know Jalen Hurts can light it up through the air, but when you have a big lead, I mean, when Brock Purdy went down, you kind of felt the uh, energy leave the 49ers team. You kind of knew that the game was pretty much put, in the, put away right then and there. Uh, but with Jalen Hurts, save him. We know he was injured the last few weeks of the season. Let's make sure he's completely 100% healthy going into the biggest game of his career. Absolutely. Yeah, and the running backs is really what got it done, as we mentioned, for the Eagles. Kenneth Gainwell, Boston Scott, Miles Sanders running all over this 49ers defense that looked pretty stout for a lot of part of the regular season. A lot of running touchdowns and definitely a great push from these veteran linemen. Jason, talk a little bit about these guys. Jason Kelsey, Lane Johnson, some would say they're old. It didn't look like it. it. Really has not looked like it all season. Been super, super solid, right? Couldn't agree more. Jason Kelsey is one of my favorite linemen in the league. Amazing personality. Loves hitting hard in the trenches. He is just a ball of energy. And he, and he just brings the, the rest of the line around him. Just gets him excited, gets him going, and just brings that extra step of energy that that Eagles offense needs. And he's just fun to be around. You hear Jalen Hurts laughing at how fast his snaps are, and they always joke around. They just have great chemistry on that Eagles offense. And, I mean, that's what's really brought them to where they are today, going to the Super Bowl. Absolutely. And we'll wrap up this short NFL segment with a too early or not too early, whatever you want to call it. Super Bowl prediction. We'll have an in-depth uh, preview of the Super Bowl next Thursday on Rebel Watch, or excuse me, next Friday. But I would like to get y'all's opinions. Joseph, we'll start with you. I'm going to go uh, Philly, 31-28. All right, Jason? Yeah, I'm going, I'm going Philly, 28-24. I think the Chiefs are too banged up. I've got Kansas City, 28-14. to I think it's going to be way too much for that young Philadelphia core. We'll stay on the football field. We'll do a quick little look in at Lane Kiffin's special transfer portal and some signees that the team's brought on. Ole Miss obviously losing a few key players. You lose Mingo, you lose some of these other guys, but adding some new talent as well. One particular place they've retooled has been at the tight end position. Caden Pricecorn from Memphis, a pretty big transfer for the team. Joseph, talk a little bit about, we got two really solid tight ends now with him and Trigg, and especially next year, assuming we'll stick with this run-heavy style with Judkins. 
What does that mean when you've got two great tight ends to get in there in the trenches and help out, catch a couple passes along the way, too? I mean, we, we see it in the NFL game. You get two stud tight ends, you kind of can do whatever. You can tear up your opponent through the air, or you can slice them and dice them on the ground. The two tight ends will set the tone, and hopefully Trey can have a bounce back year. Absolutely. And we'll talk about the QB room a little bit, too. Spencer Sanders and Walker Howard brought in. What can we make of this? You know, we, we got three guys in our QB room that could be starters for a lot of teams in the SEC. So sort of an interesting dynamic there. There's been some differing opinions on Darth's still going to be the starter. It's all a mind game to motivate him. Jason, what do you think about this? And I'll get your opinion on this as well, Joseph. Who will be the starting quarterback for the Ole Miss Rebels next year? When you look at it, what a great, uh, great problem to have in the quarterback room. we got three great quarterbacks. Walker Howard, not proven yet, but there's a lot of talk around him. Still so young. I don't think he's quite going to be the starting quarterback yet. Spencer Sanders coming in from Oklahoma State, a four-year starter. A little banged up last year, but a four-year starter at a decent to pretty good Oklahoma State squad. And he said in the presser coming into Oxford, he says, I saw the quarterback room and I had confidence in myself that I can win that job. And that just speaks volumes for his confidence. And he knows exactly where he's at. And if he knew he couldn't win this job at Ole Miss, he would have never transferred here in his fifth year in college. I think, I think Spencer Sanders wins the job. Joseph, your take on this? I have to agree. Spencer Sanders will be the now. But keep your eye open for Walker Howard to take over next year, following Spencer Sanders one year with Ole Miss. Five-star kid out of Lafayette, Louisiana. Ton of potential LSU transfer. Keep your eyes on him, guys. All right. Personally, I think Kiffin is going to stick with Dart, at least for the beginning part of the season. Heading towards the tail end of the show here on Rebel Watch, we'll wrap things up with some NBA action. The Memphis Grizzlies are rolling second seed in the West currently. Coming off a couple wins that they've put together, and it's been the usual suspects. John Morant having an unreal season. This new wave of stars in the NBA, these guys have really arrived now. Went through a couple-year period there. It was kind of a funny in-between stage. Now these guys, Tatum, Booker, Luka, Trey Young, John Morant, they're here. They're making big impacts for their teams. And one guy on the Grizzlies that has sort of flown a little under the radar is Steven Adams. Been really, really solid in the paint. Sort of almost reminds us of the grit and grind style the Grizzlies played in the early 2010s with Marcus Gasol, Zach Randolph, those great teams that had some success in the playoffs. Jason, talk a little bit about Steven Adams' impact in the paint, getting those rebounds, blocking shots, really helping out. It's clear when you look at the Grizzlies and you see them at a fully healthy lineup, they're unstoppable. They could be anyone in the league with Desmond Bain, who a great shooter, John Morant, electric. Steven Adams gets the board. He's a big body. When they're healthy, they're a great squad. And to start the year, when they were fully healthy, they were unstoppable. Steven Adams has been hurt the last couple weeks. They've been on a little bit of a skid, coming off a loss to uh, the Trailblazers and a couple other uh, decent squads. But when this team is healthy, they can go far, and I think they will go far this year. Absolutely. And, you know, ultimately their competition in the West is going to be Denver. And you need a guy like Steve Adams in there when Denver's got Nikola Jokic there in the paint, scoring a whole lot of points for them. You mentioned Desmond Bain. Joseph, I'll turn it to you. Talk about him. Averaging 21 a game pretty quietly. No one really talking about him as a great scorer. He certainly is. Without a doubt. I mean, I don't, I don't believe he started the season off uh, in the starting lineup. I think he was banged up to start the year off. But we knew once he got back onto this team that Memphis would just pick things up. A 40-plus percent three-point shooter. He's a great shooter, great two-way player as well. You don't hear about him a lot because you got other guys on, on Memphis that do the speaking for the team, like a Ja Morant, like a Jaron Jackson Jr., the high-energy guys that are also going to talk that talk. But as a whole, they are going to back it up as well. Absolutely. And we will conclude the show with this, we're pretty much at the mid-season point here in the NBA season. Early finals predictions from you two? Uh, I'm going to go with a sleeper team. Started off super hot. Injuries have derailed them, but keep an eye out for the New Orleans Pelicans. We know they were a force to be reckoned with when a full healthy lineup of C.J. McCollum, Brandon Ingram, and Zion Williamson. They held the number one spot just before Brandon Ingram got hurt and missed uh, about two months. Keep an eye out for them and in the East. Can't take your eyes off the Celtics, am I right? Absolutely, yeah. And the Pelicans, definitely a team that can flat out get it done on the offensive end. Jason, your prediction? For the West, I think it's Denver. I think they're just too well put together. 
I think Jokic is the best player in the league, and I think he's going to win MVP again this year. But when you look at his supporting cast with Jamal Murray, they're just an unstoppable team. And I, don't, and I mean, when you look at that squad and you see how good they are, you think, where have they been the past couple of years? But Jokic has another level this year. Who thought he can get any better than what he was last year? But he, I mean, he's step up and he's even better. A lot of injuries around that squad, but they're still right there in the pack. And from the East, I got the Brooklyn Nets. I got the Brooklyn Nets for one reason. His name is Kevin Durant. He's been hurt. Nets have been on a skid. Once he comes back, him and Kyrie are on a mission. And I think the Brooklyn Nets in six will beat the Denver Nuggets. Interesting picks. I'll keep it simple. I've got the Boston Celtics winning the finals. I'd like to thank all of you so much for tuning in for another edition of Rebel Watch. Tune in every Friday. Changing up the cast a little bit, but still the same great sports talk here on Rebel Watch. Joseph Rogers, Jason Kern, I'm Carson Ware. Thank you so much and have a great weekend.